we begin with the lecture four of our course on astronomical data analysis using Python. This is a slide that I had shown in the previous lecture, but there was a question about it in the discussion that we had afterwards. And so I thought I should go back and just try to explain this a little bit better in greater detail. So what does this code snippet show? We've set a string called hello exclamation mark to the variable A. And then we followed that up with a for loop, which has for i comma c in enumerate A. And then we print two things. One, integer and one string okay and uh, that's in the standard print format the question that was asked was what exactly does enumerate a do before we get there notice that i plus one is used because python is zero indexed uh, so you want character number one to appear not character number zero and therefore you're printing i plus one uh, rather than i but the main question was, what does enumerate A do? So in order to explain that, what I've done is I have simplified this program a little bit. And this is a strategy that you can gainfully follow when you are programming in Python. If something is going wrong, uh, try to make a minimal use case where, uh, where you can help, where you can diagnose what the problem is. In this case, we are not diagnosing a problem, but we are trying to understand what the enumerate function does. Enumerate is a built-in function in Python. And what it does is you know, will become clear from this little code snippet. So what I've done is I've just replaced i comma c uh, uh, in uh, enumerate a that we had in the previous slide with just for i in enumerate a, uh, just print the value of i. And when you do that, you see that on every line, you get a tuple. And how do we know it's a tuple? Because it is enclosed in these curved brackets. And each tuple has two values. For example, the first tuple is zero comma uh, string h. Okay. So notice what it has done here. It has taken the string hello, and it has it is printing out for you uh, the enumerate function is returning a tuple where every row corresponds to uh, every character of that character of that string hello. But you also get in addition a number, just a sequential number that is associated with that uh, with that string. So you, uh, zero is associated with H because h is the zeroth character of the string hello. Similarly, one is associated with e, uh, with the letter e, uh, because it is the uh, first or second character of that character string. So by printing out a simplified version of the output uh, of uh, what enumerate does, we are able to understand cleanly uh, what was happening in this program, right? So now for i comma c in enumerate a, i is going to take the values uh, 0, 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, etc. And c is going to take progressively the values of the uh, characters in the string hello. So it's going to be h, e, l, and so on. So, and then of course you will understand what we did in that print statement, which is just a use of regular C style uh, string formatting uh, in the print statement, right? So I hope this clarifies for you what enumerate does. It returns for you uh, uh, a tuple, which contains as its first element, the, the index of the iterable, whether it's the zeroth object, first object, and so on. And then the, iterated value of the iterable itself. You can try to modify this by instead of putting a is equal to hello the string, you put a as a list with maybe four or five strings and just see what happens. So I encourage you to experiment. I hope all of you have been at least via the Jupyter Collab, sorry, the Google Collab environment 
have been able to access the notebooks, use them uh, in your uh, in practicing your understanding of Python. So before we progress further, let us take stock of what we have covered so far in the first three lectures. We started out by asking the question, why uh, do we use Python? What are its advantages? What are its disadvantages? We discussed its basic ideas and design philosophy. Uh, it's called the Zen of Python, which we saw by just typing import this at the Python prompt. I pointed you to online learning resources for documentation, for videos, for co other courses similar to this one, which will help you understand Python. Then we also said very specifically that we are going to take a slice of Python that is our own, and that is designed to take you to uh, doing astronomical data analysis in the fastest time possible. This implies that we will skip certain aspects of Python that are not directly relevant to uh, writing programs for data analysis. But this is a conscious decision. It's made because we want to cover uh, a lot of ground in just 10 lectures. Thereafter, we started looking at the various data types, floats, strings, ints, integers, and their main typecasting functions that allowed you to convert input. For example, the input that we read, read was a string, which we then tried to convert into floats and so on. Then we looked at the print function and how string formatting uh, happens in Python and uh, how you can then print out whatever outputs you want in whatever uh, ASCII format that you would like. In that context, we looked at tuple unpacking where you multiple uh, values can be set uh, in one line uh, assigned to different variables. Uh, we looked at some of the built in functions like the dir function, the help function, the type function, and so on. Then we looked at the Boolean data type, uh, which evaluates only to two values, true or false. And we looked at how expressions can be evaluated uh, to uh, either true or false in the Boolean context. We looked at sequences uh, in the context, uh, context of strings and how sequences could be sliced uh, in various ways. We looked at the concept of mutability, which means once an object is created, uh, once a sequence is created, can it be changed? So if, if you're looking at uh, strings, for example, we saw that strings are immutable. You can't reassign an element of a string uh, directly, but we saw that other objects uh, like uh, lists, for example, the elements of a list are mutable. They can be changed at any time. We got quickly introduced to Python as an uh, object-oriented uh, programming language, uh, we saw that many things in Python are an object. So a uh, uh, variable is an object. Even the digit three or the digit five or the uh, number 7.5 are all individual objects as far as Python is concerned. In addition to this, more complicated data structures, which we encountered later on, uh, like lists and uh, dictionaries and so on, those are also objects. Sequences are objects, strings are objects. You will find a little later that even functions are objects. And so there is, once you get the object oriented programming way of thinking uh, into your brain, you'll find that there are many things that you can just do in a very intuitive manner because Python provides full support for object-oriented programming. We then looked at conditionals. Uh, we looked at the if, elif, else structure that allows you to evaluate a condition and depending on whether the condition uh, uh, evaluates to Boolean true or false, uh, you can run uh, different parts of the code. 
Then we looked at loops. Uh, basically, there are two kinds of uh, loops in Python, the while loop and the for loop. And then in that context, we encountered for the first time uh, uh, indentation. And we saw that indentation is very important in Python. It is the only way of defining the scope of a block of code. Uh, we encountered uh, in these in the context of loops, we encountered the break and continue statement. And we saw that break allows you to break out of a particular loop and continue in the context uh, of for allows you to just uh, continue doing uh, the next iteration of the loop. Then we looked at ordered structures like sequences, which we had already encountered in the form of uh, strings, but we also looked at lists and saw how uh, lists are. And we also saw how various methods can be used to operate on lists. Then we looked at unordered uh, labeled structures, which is the dictionary. And we saw how dictionaries can be very helpful when you have a lot of data and you want to quickly put out, pull out one or two pieces uh, of that data for, for your understanding. We spoke a little bit about the elements of good programming style. And we spoke of it in the context of the PEP 8, as it's called, Python Enhancement Proposal 8. And uh, I pointed you to the PEP and I encourage you to read through the PEP and try to use as much of uh, the PEP recommendations as you can. Because if you form good habits early on in computer programming, then your life becomes very much easier. So as you can see, we have covered uh, a lot of ground in the short space of uh, three lectures. And we've basically covered about half of the core Python. In the remaining part of this lecture and possibly a bit of the next lecture, we are going to cover a little more of core Python before we move on to uh, the module space of third party modules. So what are we going to cover next? We are going to cover uh, file IO, how to read and write data from files. Uh, then we are going to look in some detail at functions in Python. And then we will move on to looking at modules in the Python programming language. Let us begin by looking at how we can handle uh, data in files. This can be done through a simple exercise. In any programming language, the basic approach for file operations remains the same. The basic approach involves creating something known as a file object and then using various methods that are associated with file objects to do the actual input and output of data. So what are the steps that you typically take and what are the functions uh, uh, for file handling in Python uh, that are useful? So the first thing uh, you need to do is to create a file object and that is done via the open function. Once you have a file object open, then you can read or write, okay? Uh, it reads uh, in the entire file as one big string. And file object dot write writes a string into a file. <clears throat> if you want to read each line separately as an element of a list, uh, you use the read lines method or read lines function of the uh, file object object. For writing lines, you have uh, to write a set of lines, each one which of which is a string, you use the write lines method. Once you are done reading and writing uh, files, uh, uh, you close the file handle. And this is known as a buffer flush because it's only uh, until that time, whatever 
reading and writing that you are doing is basically just moving uh, uh, things into RAM, particularly writing. When you uh, write to a file handle, it's not actually saved on your disk. It is just saved into the file object buffer. Once you do a close uh, operation on that file handle, that is when it actually gets written to disk. So if your computer crashes before you do a file object dot close, then bad things can happen to you. Maybe you lose all the data that you have written to that file object. I will point out here that uh, the, uh, we are looking at file objects here in the context of reading and writing very simple ASCII files. But in real life, when you start doing astronomical data analysis, you will need to write very large files. So that we will revisit at a later stage. Okay, so we want to do a simple operation. We want to take one input file, which has some text in it, and we want to write uh, the output, a modified file with a .sp extension. And we are going to uh, do this simple operation. Uh, for that, we need, we are going to initially show, I'm going to show it to you by how we can do this by providing command line arguments uh, to a Python program. And that is done via a module named sys, which we need to parse these command line arguments that we provide. And we'll also look at uh, a, a module called OS, which is used to check for the file's existence. So let's look at the code. So now this may seem a little bit unfamiliar, but don't panic. We are going to go line by line over the code so that you understand. So there is something known as sys.argv. So what is that? So if you supply command line arguments to a program, those get stored into an array called sys.argv. Why argv? That has its roots in C. So for those of you who know C, uh, would know that a C program uh, can take command line arguments. And there the designation is argv, argc, etc. So that is why the reason is uh, uh, historical. So now if length dot sys dot argv is equal to two, then is going to uh, assign a variable called in file name to uh, uh, the array sys.argv1. So it's going to take the value of sys.argv1 and assign it to the variable uh, in file name. If not, it's going to print an error. Oops, you have the incorrect number of arguments and then it is going to exit the program. If, so the first thing you do is to check if the file exists. So it'll do this. If, uh, yeah, so it'll create that in file name and then it will check if the file exists. If not os.path, dot is file in file name. So this is now a built-in module called OS and it has a sub uh, module called path and that has a method called is file. So what this uh, method does, the is file method does, it, it checks whether in file name exists. If it doesn't exist, it just prints file doesn't exist and it quits, right? And it gives you an exception, an error, right? Now, when I try to run this snippet of code inside a Jupyter notebook, it gives me an error immediately. 
because we are not able to supply command line arguments easily uh, to a browser based uh, software. So what we are going to do now is going to jump back into the terminal. Uh, so now I have opened a simple Linux terminal. I have uh, CD to the directory where I have my Py Python programs. And what I have here is a argv demo.py. So this is the code that we were just looking at. Now that has been put into a python.py file uh, on in this directory, right? And what <clears throat> we need to do is, suppose I type python3 and uh, I uh, uh, type the name of the program that I want to run, which is this one. And then I give it some arguments, say three, four, five. Now it should crash because, not crash, it should print out an error message and exit because uh, we have the number of arguments that is given is not two, but is more than two. So while counting arguments, everything after the Python three statement is counted as an argument. So this is the first argument, second argument, third argument, fourth argument. So there are too many arguments, there are four arguments. If you print five arguments also, it will again give you the same error, right? Now I say that, okay, this guy is looking for two arguments uh, for success. So let me give it two arguments. I've already given one argument here in the form of argvdemo.py. I'll supply it one more argument, say three. Okay. Now, now it goes successfully past this block, but in the next block, it runs into trouble because what it does is in this block, the number of arguments is correct. So it has assigned sys.argv1 value to in file name. Now what is sys.argv1 in this case? This is sys.argv square bracket zero. And this is sys.argv square bracket one. So it goes looking for a file name three and it doesn't find it. Since the file doesn't exist, so this is the command. If not os.path is file in file name, this of course this condition, this if condition including the not is now satisfied. So it simply prints this file doesn't exist and, and quits the game, right? Now there is more to the code, uh, which uh, we will go, but before we go there, let us look at a file called sample dot uh, text. So this is a simple text file. This is a simple uh, sample text file to demonstrate reading and writing of files. That's all it contains. Okay, some 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 text. Right. So now let us go back to our code, and then do what we were supposed to do via the command line argument, but now we do it via hard coding the name of the file. So we've covered the, the logic of this part of the program. Let us now move on and uh, do the program what this actually does. So now we've hard coded for simplicity. I mean, we could have, because it doesn't work from within a Jupyter uh, notebook cell, I have now hard uh, coded the name of the file that I intended to supply, right? Now it does, what does this next line tell you? It tells you that there is, you know, I want you to create a file handle called in file. And I want you to open the file in file name, which is in this case, sample.text. And this R it will again be familiar for those of you who've done C programming, means that this file handle or this file is to be opened only in read only mode which means if I try to write 
data to that file, it will give me an error. So, but anyway, I just want to read this file. I'm not going to write to that file. I'm going to write to some other file. Right? So I opened the in file. Similarly, I then opened an out file with another open command. And then uh, I gave it a different name. I called it in file underscore name plus dot sp. So this is the string concatenation. Uh, this is the string concatenation op operator. So whatever the uh, input file was, uh, sample.txt, uh, now a new file will be created called sample.txt.sp. And this one will be in W or write mode. So I have uh, opened one file for reading and I've opened a second file or created a second file called sample.txt.sp for writing. Now, I do the for loop. For line in infile.readlines, so infile.readlines, remember, is going to read all the lines of text in the sample.txt file, right? And it is going to loop over the iterable and give me one line at a time, right? Uh, and line is equal to line plus backslash n backslash n indicates a return character or a new line character so it's going to add a new line character at the end of each line remember each line itself has a new line character now it's going to add one more which means it's going to add a blank line after every line and each of those lines are going to be written to the out file via uh, this statement. Once we are done looping over all the lines in the input, we close the out file file handle and we close the uh, in file uh, file handle. I strongly encourage you to uh, read, uh, practice reading and writing simple text files on your own. Okay, I'm not going to share with you my sample dot text file. You create some some random text file. When we go to assignment one, which you should get within a few days for three or four days, uh, we will require you to have these skills of reading and writing simple uh, text files. And as I mentioned a few minutes earlier, reading of uh, and writing of large data files, images, spectra, data cubes, etc., which you will encounter in your real life astronomy data analysis, that will be fought, uh, taught to you a few lectures later. However, I encourage you to practice this simple reading and writing of text files because the process that you will use for writing those data, opening the file handle, then read or write the data, close the file handle, remain exactly the same. So you'll use this open function, you'll lose, use the close uh, function uh, or method uh, in your work, whether you're reading uh, 10 lines of ASCII code or you're reading a 10 gigabit, uh, gigabyte data file, it doesn't matter. The process is going to be exactly the same. So I strongly encourage you to read and write uh, the data files. Okay. So that's uh, on file IO for the moment. I've given you a very simplistic introduction. There are many complicated things that can be done uh, uh, in file IO. Uh, but we are going to anyway encounter it again uh, in, a, in the context of reading and writing large uh, binary blobs, uh, large amounts of uh, actual data. So uh, we are not going to cover that anymore uh, in any great detail. We now move on to the next uh, important uh, data structure or structure in the Python programming language, which is functions. So what are functions? Functions are blocks of code that perform a specific task. They're very useful in avoiding replication of code where the same or a very similar task is being carried out multiple times inside a program. So when you start writing code, you just write code without writing functions. But then 
eventually you realize that okay i'm just repeating uh, the same code again and again it's occurring seven times in my program so why don't i just make a function and i call that function every time i need that same same or similar functionality and so i save on the lines of code and also makes my code cleaner and more readable in python a function is defined using the def uh, keyword uh, we've al already looked at multiple examples of built in functions float dict list len etc within the math module we looked at radians and sine and uh, all those 42 functions so there are uh, we've already encountered and we already used functions what we are going to learn now is how we can define our own functions and use them. So whatever we have used so far are the built-in functions. Let us write a simple function that has no arguments. The structure of the function is as follows. You write def because you are defining a function. Then you write a name for your function. So I call it my fun, my function. And you always must have, even if you have no arguments to the function, you must have that curved open bracket, close bracket while defining the function. Then you put a colon sign. So uh, just like you did while defining a for loop or a while loop, et cetera, while defining a function, you must have that uh, colon sign, which is over here. And our function has uh, very simple things. It just says print hello world, uh, print uh, nice to see you on the next line. And in this code block outside of the function, we've uh, said put a line called print outside the function. How do we know that it's outside the function? Remember, just like while blocks and for blocks are scoped by indentation, functions uh, are also the end of a function is indicated by just removal of the indentation, right? So now if I just run this code block, the function itself gets defined and that print outside the function gets printed. And that is why you have outside the function over here. A function is not executed until it is called so you have to call the function in for it to be uh, executed so in order to execute this function we simply call the function my fun uh, open bracket square bracket again here the open bracket square bracket are needed because that indicates that this is a function call and what would that do it won't print outside the function because that is not part of the function, but it is going to print, uh, it's going to execute these two lines of the function. And it's going to give you uh, this output as you see here. Right. Now let us do a slightly more complicated function, a function with one argument. So what this does is it's, uh, it has one argument, which is A, and uh, it just print inside my fun function, and it prints the value of A. Now, remember, we've redefined my fun. So it needs, if I give it, call it with zero arguments, uh, it'll give me an error, because this is now a function with one argument. A, if you don't supply it with any argument and you call it like this, it's going to give you an error. And see, Python provides you very useful hints about the error. It says, my fun is missing one required positional argument A. That's a very nice thing about Python. In some of the other programming languages, the error is, is so difficult to understand for a non-programmer, for a non-expert, that you don't know what is the, what went wrong, right? So it gives you an error. Now, let's run it again. 
this time if you say my fun and input right is going to execute that function and what is it going to do it's going to print the standard string but it's also going to print whatever you supplied it now you must remember that python is a dynamically typed language so unlike some of the other languages when you define my fun you would have to say string uh, a or integer a float a etc python variables are dynamically typed and therefore you can also call the above a function with a float or an integer or even a list if i say my fun 5 it says inside my fun and prints out the number 5 if i supply it with a list like this one it uh, simply prints out the list now we come to functions that return something they don't just execute a block of code but they return some value so we'll create a function called add which takes two inputs or two arguments a comma b and what does it do it returns a plus b so it, you'd supply it with two numbers and it simply adds them together and uh, sends them back so here when we call the function we have to now assign the returned value to a variable so we assign it to a and we say a is equal to add 2 comma 3 when you do a print a it prints 5 because uh, that's the addition of 2 comma 3 that is what is returned by this function uh just for fun if i had given it uh, two strings okay uh, if i had given add hello world would that have worked Uh, you can try it and you will realize that it works uh, even if you give it two strings except that now the add function is not an addition of two numbers but it becomes a string concatenation operator remember this will return a valid value if uh, you supply it something where a plus b has meaning So, for example, if I set a to a string and b to a number, then you cannot concatenate. You cannot uh, concatenate a string with a non-string, so it's going to return an error. A function that does not have a return statement returns by default an object called none. Right. So b is equal to my fun hello inside my fun hello, right? uh gets gets printed or what is the value of b if you do print b it says none so it returns an object the none object is what gets returned if you have any function call that does not have an associated uh return statement functions can return more than one value at a time okay so for example in fortran 77 you had functions if you wanted to return only one value and you had something called subroutines where if you wanted to change multiple values uh, in your code uh, you needed to use subroutines but in python there are no such complications uh, so here is a function defined called sum prod uh, as the name suggests it returns the sum and the product of the two arguments uh, that you supply Uh, return a plus b uh, is a multiplied by b, and there of course it's good since it's going to return a tuple. You have to do your standard tuple unpacking, where I unpack the sum into variable s and the product into variable p. Uh, technically speaking, Python is not returning multiple values; it's returning only one object, but that object is a tuple. Uh, in the above case and that's why we've used the tuple unpacking uh, uh, uh syntax uh, in order to unpack those uh, variables here we've returned two variables but you could have returned 20 or 200 and you can return arrays you can 
and so on. Now let's look at uh, a very powerful functionality of uh, functions where you want a function to assume some value for some arguments when I don't provide them. Okay. So here you have a function which has a mess, which basically prints a message. And the message has a default value of good day. Okay. If you call this function uh, by pass, passing an argument, then the value of message changes. So look here. If you say my fun hello world, this time we've uh, provided hello world as an argument. So it prints hello world. But if we call the function without any argument, then it prints the default message of uh, good day. So this is very, very useful because you can set intelligent default values for your function. For example, you're doing some data analysis, you create a function to do that data analysis for you. And many of the parameters that you want, uh, you set them as uh, to some default values. And so the user, they can run it with all defaults or if they want to change some of the parameters of your, uh, of your uh, analysis code, they can change whatever parameters they want by supplying just the parameters that they want to change. Very, very powerful. You can also have functions that take an arbitrary number of arguments and that you do by using the, the symbol star and the, and the name of the uh, arguments. Right. So we created something called sum it all star values. So we set total to zero for I in values, total is equal to plus equal to one, which means total is equal to total plus I not one I. And then we return the total. So if you supply it four numbers, uh, two, three, four, five, it's going to add, add them all and return the total. Or uh, if you supply three numbers, you just add them, those three numbers together and supply a total. Even if you supply it without any arguments, it's going to just uh, not run, run through this for block at all. It, set, uh, it will set total to zero and it will return the total. So that also comes out right. You can also have uh, uh, a second kind of function where you supply one value and you may supply two or more additional values. So this is our sum it all two function where this value is, is mandatory and that gets set to the total and additional values in star values uh, may or may not be there, right? So if I do sum it all two, uh, it will uh, just give me the value two uh, as the total one, at least one value is needed. If I do sum it all without an argument, it will give me an error. If I run it like this without argument, if I run this function, it will give me an error. But I, if I give it one or more arguments, it will give me the sum, right? So here we see, like if we give it, don't give it an argument, then it will, uh, it requires at least one positional argument value. This way you can design functions the way you want, want by imposing both a minimum number of arguments and have the flexibility to provide an arbitrary number of really, really, really well thought out uh, way of making functions. This is, they're even more powerful because functions are objects like lists, dictionaries in floats, strings, etc. cetera. Uh, you can pass functions to other functions since they are uh, just objects. So uh, we define a function which 
just prints a message. It's a very simple uh, function. Whatever message gets passed to it, it gets printed. And define do is basically what it does is another function which takes two arguments, f and r, right? And it basically runs the function you want to run along with the arguments. So this is a very, very simple uh, function which passes a function and an argument and it basically executes that function. So when you say do my fun something, it basically says this is the function I want to run and this is the argument to that function. Uh, this is what is passed through here and here the function call to the function uh, 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 operating on the function f with the arguments uh, happens. So it basically runs my fun because f is my fun and uh, arguments are something. So it runs my fun with message something which gets printed. You can even relabel uh, a function as a variable. Okay. So if you do x is equal to my fun, now the variable x. Uh, is identical to the my fun function. It's also a function. And if you now call x hello, uh, uh, it just prints hello. Right. So this is the power of uh, objects, object-oriented programming as applied to functions. Some lectures ago, we had used help math.hypotenuse to get help on understanding how to use the hypot function. Can we design our own function myfun and ensure that myfun also gives a nice help output? Okay. And you do that by defining this myfun now is just an is a function which adds two numbers a and b or uh, and there we followed it with a what's called a triple coated string. Normally strings either have a double coat or a single coat at each end. But if you put triple coats both at the beginning or uh, and at the end of a string, then that becomes what is called a multi line string. So you can have any number of lines uh, between this triple coat and this triple coat. And the whole thing will be one single string with new line characters uh, separating the different lines of that particular uh, string. Now, the beauty of this is whatever you put as a triple coated string right after your def uh, function line, that gets automatically included as the help of that function. So if you now type help my fun, it says help on function my fun in module main, because that's your main program, my fun a b. So it tells you that it takes two arguments. The input is two objects and output is the sum of the two input objects uh, here. So you can use this to document exactly what your function does. What are the input parameters of that function and what does it return. Uh, very, very useful. These are, of course, two lines, but you could have 20 lines with a very detailed description of what your function does. So whenever you are designing functions on your own, it is very good practice to document what the function does, even if it is in one or two lines, so that you and the others can use it in the future without actually reading your whole source code of that function. People can type help and the name of your function, and it will tell you exactly what it does. Now, there are many, many functions that are built in in Python. Uh, they're uh, listed here. These uh, are uh, all of them in alphabetical order. We have encountered some of them. Right. For example, uh, uh, we have encountered dict. We have encountered dir. Uh, we have encountered enumerate at the start of this lecture. Uh, we have encountered format. We've uh, encountered help. 
we've encountered input uh, and so on. So about half of the functions here uh, we've already encountered and we will encounter some more uh, in the uh, lectures to come. Let me now uh, move on to modules. Uh, we will not be able to finish our discussion on modules uh, in this lecture, but we will uh, continue with it in the following lecture as well. So what are modules? Modules can be considered as namespaces, which have a collection of objects which you can use when needed. So the first module that we encountered, the math module, we saw has 42 objects, which includes two numbers, the number e and pi, and 40 functions. Uh, some of those functions are hidden functions, which you're not supposed to use in your programs, but some of them are functions, regular sign, cos, tan, etc., which you can use in your programs. Whenever you run your program directly, then it is treated as a module uh, with a special name called underscore main underscore. So all the variables that you define, like we've been doing A, B, C, et cetera, and the functions that you create are said to live in the namespace of main. When you say the following, you're making the namespace of math available to you. So when we said I import math, we were making the namespace of math available to us for us to use the function visited. And how do you access something inside math? You say math dot object. So when you type import something, when we typed import math, for example, what exactly happened? When we typed import math and pressed enter, the Python interpreter went looking for the math.py file in the current directory or in the installation directory in that order. And of course, it won't find it in the current directory because we don't have it. Uh, so it would have found it in the Python installation directories and it would have found a file called math.py. So once you have your Python installed, you can go looking at the source code for math.py. It finds that and it compiles the file math.py if it is not already compiled. Next, it creates a handle of the same name that is math, which can be used to access the objects that are living inside the math module. So import math, if you do type math, math of course is a module and therefore you get module printed over there. There is another way to import. Okay, I'll spend a few minutes on this because this is amongst the most dangerous things you can do within Python. In the above example, you are accessing objects inside math through the module object that Python created. It is possible to make these objects part of the current namespace, which in your program would be the underscore main underscore namespace. If you type the following command from math import star, right? Now, if you do that, then you don't have to type math.radians in order to uh, use the radians function. From math import star, radians 45, right? And uh, it of course works, it gives you the right value. Uh, it converts the 45 degrees into radians in this case, but it is extremely dangerous. Because if your own program and the module have common objects, then the above statement will cause enormous confusion. This is the single most stupid thing you can do as a Python programmer. So please don't ever do from some module import star. Just don't do it. Okay. I cannot emphasize this enough. Python is a program that makes it 
very hard to get things wrong. But they have this kind of bomb which is sitting there. If you use it, you are at your own risk. I'll give you an example. Suppose you did uh, from math import star, right? It imported all the thing into your namespace. At the top of your program, you've defined your own function, right? Uh, which, uh, let us say you defined a radiance function without realizing that radiance is a built-in function in the math model. So you define your radiance function, which does something, right? You do from math import star after defining that function in your code. Now what has happened is that radiance function that you have defined is clobbered with the maths math dot radiance function. When you actually use the radiance function in your code, you are thinking that you are using uh, your radiance function because you have defined it in your code. But what your act, uh, Python is actually executing is the math dot radiance function. And when you do that, you're basically spending hours and hours trying to figure out why your uh, answers are slightly different from what you expect. And you expect because it's not even executing your code, it's executing some other code. So for this reason, please don't use from some module import because you don't know what all methods are de derived there, are defined there. Math has only about 40, 45 uh, functions within it, but there are some other modules, for example, NumPy, which has literally hundreds of, of functions defined. And it's very likely that a function that you define like uh, least square fit, for example, if there is a function of the same name inside NumPy, your function gets clobbered. And then you uh, 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 have, uh, get totally confused. So don't do it. There is a middle ground. If there is an object you specifically want to use uh, and you use it frequently, you could make it uh, part of your main namespace. So from module name import object. So for example, it turns out you're using the sign function all the time. You don't want to type math.sign every time. So you say from math import sign. This I can live with, right? Uh, this is uh, not advisable, avoid it. But if you can't avoid it, I will uh, I'll say okay. But this is not half as bad or a 10th as bad as from some module import star. That is really, really bad. Uh, remember that if you import the same module in the same program with an import statement, Python does not actually reload the module. It does nothing. It says that this module is already loaded, so I'll do nothing. I'll go to the next slide. If you want to actually reload the module for uh, some reason, uh, right? You have to do a reload, uh, fun use the reload built-in function, reload module name for uh, reloading. But what is allowed to save you effort in typing is to define aliases for a module. So if you want, if you have decided to access a module's objects uh, from its own namespace, you can choose to have an alias uh, for the module. So for example, you can say import numpy as np and then np.array, np whatever else. So now np becomes a short form for numpy. In fact, numpy itself becomes unavailable to you. If you say numpy.array on the next line, it won't work. But if you say import numpy as np, you have aliased it to a short form. And please use standard uh, abbreviations. So NP is the standard abbreviation for, for NumPy. Uh, we will encounter another uh, uh, module called matplotlib uh, in a few lectures. So matplotlib has for its most of its plotting functionality, the matplotlib package has a, a sub package called pyplot 
and uh, very often you uh, when you make plots you can do this import matplotlib.pyplot as plt and uh, then you make plots of x and y okay so i'm going to stop here there's a little bit of more discussion on modules but uh, we finished the hour uh, so i'm going to stop and i'm going to take your uh, questions thank you uh, my name is parag from don bosco university guwahati okay. uh, sir i'm actually curious yeah, about yeah, no that uh, IO function that you yes, had, uh, yes. IO operations that you had shown at the beginning of the lecture. So over there you had used uh, exit two and exit three. So I'm just curious as to what these arguments two and three. Yes. Were yes. So these these are actually uh, the uh, uh, the exit. Uh, it's the arguments that are given to sys dot exit which get returned so if you run the program uh, then the, the sys dot exit and you catch this uh, this loop okay it will uh, if you run it from the command line you can capture the value of this variable uh, this number into the program and it, it's, it's just arbitrarily defined. It is whatever is returned by uh, sys.exist. So if I have my program, I can uh, know that if I get an exit value of two, that means I had the incorrect number of arguments. If I have an exit value of three, means the file doesn't exist. And exit value of four could be file is unreadable. Exit uh, sys.exit five could be something else. So it's, it's just, just defined. It tells you what, what uh, is the return value of that exit statement. So uh, that means uh, uh, it's up to yeah. us how so we can see, define it's it. printed out here. OK, sir. So I was actually thinking yes, along you can lines. put uh, anything uh, there. I think it probably has to be a number, but you can do help sys.exist, uh, sys.exit, and find out uh, yeah, whether so you can put strings there, for example. So what actually came to my mind was that uh, in C or C++ uh, at the end, we have return zero because return zero means that the program has uh, executed correctly. Uh, and that depends on the operating system, yes. what the return type is. So I was actually thinking if it means something along those lines. Correct. Thank you so much, sir, for the clarification. Yes, so I am I'm, I'm unable to recollect what it means. So I encourage you to... Uh, uh, just do uh, help sys dot exit, and uh, that will tell you uh, uh, exactly what it means. Whether okay. you can have uh, their standard values or you can have any arbitrary values. My guess is that you can have anything you want. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, Krishna Murthy here. Uh, yes. Uh, sir, where is yeah. uh, this import star is used? Is there any specific example, sir? Where do we use? Uh, uh, we will, we might use it uh, while making plots and so on. When you're doing doing things interactively, you have not written a big program. Okay, in that case, probably import star is okay where uh, you want to uh, just make a plot of x versus y and quickly see something right in a completely interactive environment there you may use it and uh, in fact uh, i will uh, the code that i've written for making plots that does use uh, import star at the moment but just as good programming practice i'm planning to replace that with a uh, with a module alias. Okay, thank you. Sir. Yeah. So Kishale says that the sys dot exit method can take any arbitrary message you want printed after exit. Yeah. And uh, Ritabrata said I use the from module import star on almost every occasion. Uh, thankfully, never ran into such problems. That's probably because you've not written very large codes. Uh, uh, the moment you do that, you will hit this. So from now, uh, I will actively avoid this. Please do that. Yeah. Uh, so there are several yes, other people, I think, who have raised hands. We can take the online questions. Uh, 
Uh, if I want to create a file in such way that in that file I want to store the numbers in rows and columns, and then if sometime I want to add some yes. rows and columns in terms of yes. the numbers, then I don't see in that file how to add that rows and columns, particularly suppose say number, a uh, particular row and particular column. Yes, I want to add that in the next yes. line. Uh, how yeah, yeah. we can do that so i will while writing uh, read i i o of more complicated files yeah yeah i'll i'll be i will cover that when i talk about the numpy module uh, a little bit but i will also okay. cover it in great detail when we talk about the astropy module uh, because astropy module has some very nice functions uh, available methods available for reading and writing uh, columns and rows of data, which we do all the time in as astronomy or any other field, you constantly be reading data and writing data. So we will cover that uh, at that time. So don't worry about it. Right now, I just want you so, to get the idea of how to open a file, how to open it in read mode or write mode, and how to close the file when you are done. So, so Yogesh, I want to ask one more question. Uh, other than this, so as you mentioned the astropy, so in astropy there is a uh, read case. There are case. Uh, so with that case we have uh, is that case we we can replace the another key like let's say frame FK five. If I want to replace that by some other thing, ICRS, like this. Yes, so uh, you'll have to edit the header. So typically this kind of okay, so, uh, WCS uh, information uh, is uh, sitting in the headers of files. Okay, you can edit. Yeah. So we will talk about that. Let's not jump the gun. Let us uh, uh, focus on things we have already covered. Uh, things which are coming in the future, you can ask me about that in the future. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Are there more people who have raised hands? Hello, sir. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Uh, so I want to ask, uh, you showed an example to how to call a function uh, within the same IPython uh, notebook. So how can we call a function which is in different IPython notebook? Uh, normally you can't, okay. Uh, so what, See, this IPython notebook structure is just to get you started, okay? Once you are proficient and you have uh, uh, codes written, uh, which are numerous, I suggest you use your own modules. Uh, put your code blocks into different modules. So you may have a linear fitting module, you may have a, a file reading writing module, you may have... Uh, uh, a plotting module, you may have various files in the module. Now, if you want to load them into uh, the same namespace, so long as the Python path is defined or all of these modules are sitting in the same directory, in the current working directory, or the Python path variable is defined, it will work. Even from within a Jupyter uh, notebook, it will work. It's only this passing of command line arguments, uh, which is tricky. So there's no problem. And in any case, just remember this notebook is just to get you started to make you feel comfortable in programming. Once you are at a stage where you're writing thousands of lines of code, uh, you don't have to use a notebook necessarily. You can use any other integrated uh, development environment, uh, Spider or PyCharm or whatever you like or I use Emacs, for example, and then uh, then you don't have to worry about this because then you can import uh, whatever you want as long as it's there in your Python path. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yeah, so for now, if you want to import other modules, you uh, the standard modules will get imported. Your own modules, if you want to import, uh, just put them in one directory. So. Uh, in the same current working directory where you are learning. 
yeah go ahead after running your code the current slide after running your you got this uh use user warning why we you are getting this warning is there any reason or in the current slide which we are saying it now uh to exit use exit yeah yeah because and... this is running inside an interactive shell it okay. correct correct that is because it underneath the jupiter notebook is a ipython shell which is running on top of the python shell so it's it's a bit complicated if you didn't use a notebook you wouldn't get uh, these errors if you just ran this uh, code snippet you'll have to use the import statements which are there in the previous slide but if you do it put these two lines and uh, all of this into a text file uh, then it will run quite happily so this is just related to the jupiter notebook uh, business yeah so there is a question what is the difference between the append mode and write mode uh, append mode is used which has already been answered by someone somebody else if the file exists in the working directory and some content is written in it uh, it will write the whatever data you want to write after the light uh, uh, last line of that file so if instead of up, so if a file exists it will uh, continue writing to that file so this is very useful if you are writing some log file or something uh, something happens you write to a log file <coughs> you don't want to destroy the existing file remember if you use the w uh, uh, mode the right mode in that it will simply flush out whatever is there in that file you open a file handle uh, of that name so if that file exists it will erase all the data in it so be careful uh, somebody says uh, uh, that the sys.exit method can take any arbitrary message you want to print after exit so this is right so uh, as i suggested if you check the help uh, you should get this so i have i've uh, there is something on the uh, previous lecture on the list dot extend method uh, the example shown was how, how to extend an ex existing list whose elements are all integer by appending more integers in the form of a list uh, however you can also add the same entries using a tuple as well strings uh, instead of uh, uh, string types all iterables are welcome the extend method is flexible so indeed that is correct uh, i have showed shown you only one way in which uh, the list extend method works uh, it's quite flexible quite powerful and can uh, allow you to uh, extend the method in various ways well, we encourage you to get python installed uh, on your uh, computer because now next time onwards we will start talking about modules and uh, third party modules as well which you will also need to install uh, separately okay. so uh, i will post some instructions on how to uh, install external modules uh, into the moodle uh, platform and uh, when we meet next time uh, we won't start using them right away but i think uh, uh, somewhere in the middle of next lecture uh, we will move into that territory